This session is brought to you by Zurich Life and Investments. These guys are one of the last true independent life insurers going around and they're Swiss, so you know their stuff is solid. These guys really understand and believe in the value of advice, which is why they invest in programs like this one and partner with groups like XY Advisor to help drive the positive evolution of financial advice in Australia. Their team are just really good people as well. So if you haven't already connected with them to learn more, check out their website or speak to your business development contact. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client's Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund, as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments, they're really, really cheap, and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout, because they're doing some really cool stuff. G'day Warwick, how's it going, mate? Good, thanks, Clay. That's good, that's good. Hey, um, so the best thing about this uh, podcast for me is because to catch everyone up to speed, uh, cryptocurrency is the fact that you are as qualified as it gets in the in the financial world. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, by that, by that, I mean. Uh, it's good at talking about it. By, by that. Uh, it, <laughs> You, you're not. You're not me. You're like the Jesus of but, the financial world. Yeah. Well, look, look, we don't have to start off with a with a low level identity crisis, you know, <laughs> which Bitcoin has suffered recently. Yes, yeah. it has, and we'll get to that. But um, could you put some context around that grand statement? Well, though? what I mean is, uh, you know, here I am uh, trying to espouse the uh, the virtues of cryptocurrency, but but I don't really know enough. Right, and and I don't have a history in in the finance markets. It's not what and your social media posts say. Eh? So <laughs> you position yourself as an expert. Hey, I know more than most, <laughs> uh, I, but it's but certainly uh, you know uh, the, I was introduced to to Warwick here recently. Um, and it made me feel a hell of a lot better because all of a sudden I had someone to lean on. So I'd be like, ah, we can with this guy, this guy, this guy. So, mate, before we get started, can we just please talk about your uh, your history in, uh-huh. in the finance space? Okay. So um, I, I started out in chartered accounting with EYs back in, uh, well, I'm going to tell you it's in the 70s and 80s, actually. I'll give Very you good. an idea how old I am now. Uh, then I went into, uh, I left that and um, finished my chartered accounting certificate and I went into um, stockbroking and financial planning and I worked with Bain & Company for 17 years and uh, we got taken over by the Deutsche Bank. And so um, at that stage, I had, I think that was a midlife crisis I had uh, in the late 30s, that's what my wife at the time said. <laughs> I'm still having it, she said. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Never stops. Eh? <laughs> no, that's right. So I remember going into I was Tribeca or one of those names at the time, which was the early days of Kaplan, and I did a couple of uh, test uh, uh, presentations because we'd done a lot of building of our client base through uh, running uh, lectures and fi- you know financial stuff like that because we actually had a seminar room in our office. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we built our practice that way, and so yeah, I started doing teaching. So I taught with Kaplan uh, from basically two thousand to the the GFC. Uh, 2009, and I trained 4,000 financial planners. Wow. Worked in Malaysia, South Africa. When we went to Joburg, they said, oh, you can't teach a diploma of financial planning in a week. Well, you can if you live in Joburg because you want to get out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> and if you wanted to get an Australian Especially visa. Especially back then. Yeah, 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 anytime. So if you wanted you know, to get an Australian visa, you needed to have a diploma so you could come in. So, yeah, I did that till there. Then I had a life coaching business for a couple of years. And uh, then I worked with the mentor group uh, when all the accountants had to get their qualification for a SMSF. Yep. Mm. Uh, so I did that. I went to buy some crypto early last year because I had a lot of students waving the Bitcoin brochure in front of me. And I kept saying, no, that stinks. That doesn't smell mm. too good. And then I, I could see all of a sudden there was a change um, happening. So I went to buy some. And before I knew it, I was working in the sector. <laughs> Just so, like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what you do. You go for a job interview when you think you're actually going to buy some crypto. So, and, Yeah, and, and I can definitely reflect that experience. It, it's amazing how, because it's such a new space, um, the moment that you get even quasi-involved, it, 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 there, is a, there is an absence of knowledge. And Correct. so it quite quickly people are falling into this, oh, you know a little bit more than me, therefore you are the expert. Yeah, well, our, our CEO, Nathan Vandenbosch, he's been in the business in, in crypto for about four years, so he's a veteran. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
And so, yeah, we've seen the increase in storage devices, um, the CME Futures launched in December. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what I was saying to uh, Clay earlier, uh, Adrian, is that what we're seeing is like 35 years of financial investment growth all, cl- all condensed yeah. into about a five-year period. Yeah. So now you're seeing managed funds coming. Yeah. It's um, reflective of, I guess, the speed of things these days. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Like almost a Bitcoin graph when you yeah. have a look at it, say, back from January the last year. Graph, you meant. <laughs> the, the, the Dutch we'll, Sheila. Yeah, we'll talk That's about that. Like yeah, okay. Yeah. That means you don't have any crypto, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it, we'll talk about the polarization. The smart the investor graph, is that what you guys call it? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the graph is representative of the learning curve. Yeah. Right? right? And, and and so and the what's gra- the what's the drop off of reflection? Yeah, well that, that's <laughs> a disappointment uh, of when you when you know what you know. You know, everyone has has that new oh, education like, service, you know. I've you, rehe- you can see I've rehearsed this. I've, yeah. rehe- I've, I've heard all of that tulip stuff. I've heard of the, you know, what about the drop? Is that an adjustment or a crash? Uh, these are all just subjective words in the English language. Any lawyer knows that. Yeah, yeah. So you're just saying, just got a bit ahead of yourself. It's, it's all yeah, yeah. Good. Not too good if you bought it twenty thousand dollars. But mm. um, currently, nine. I think this morning is nine thousand seven hundred US or something. So, you know, it was eleven thousand only four days ago. Mm. So oh, I dropped again. Of, well, uh-huh. yeah, but see, that's the viewpoint of the person that doesn't have any. They don't go, oh, the week before it was 9,000, it went to 11. They, you don't hear this bit. Well, you hear the, oh, it just dropped. great volatility yeah. going on here. <laughs> day traders must be having a field day. There, there, there's, there's, two quali- there's two ends of the scale. There, first off, because oh, I'm a member of the XY uh, Network Facebook site, and I was mm. saying to Clay, there's this huge polarisation. As soon as Muhammad Ali comes out into one corner and goes, oh, crypto is fantastic in yeah, the red corner. Joe Fraser, Joe Fraser, Fraser comes out and goes, this is the biggest load of shit, scam, tulip thing I've ever seen and I will never and put that's my just into this. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we were at the SMSF conference and like last year in um, in uh, Melbourne, we could hear crickets chirping in the booth. Mm. You know, no one was coming around and it was interesting. Our booth was actually on the end, which was probably representative of the frontier that we were breaking into. <laughs> uh, so this year we had um, 160 people visit our booth uh, and the questions weren't uh, what is Bitcoin, it was more... My clients have bought this stuff in their self-managed fund. <coughs> How are they breaching the CIS Act? Yeah. Like we can talk about oh, if you like those sort of areas. Definitely. Uh, what, what's cold storage compared to a hot wallet? Uh, how, and the auditors that were coming up were saying, how do I validate the asset? Where do I get the pricing from at June mm. 30? So these questions were much more sophisticated in terms of either acceptance or um, guidance in relation to how clients should invest and, in and, and hence why uh, <clears throat> beyond Adrian having a dig at you, why, we, why we've brought you on today because there oh, is, is a massive, we've, we've had a massive, yeah, we've oh. had a massive gap in the, in, in the knowledge of financial planners. Uh, what's <laughs> original <laughs> sin? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah, exactly. except that should, that should be your his birthday, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Not 1974. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, certainly um, th- there is a massive gap. There's a massive gap and, and, and a lot of people are now investing. I think we've all uh, moved on from the, the idea that this is a scam. Mm. Um, and so how, how do we That's as what financial... That's about Bernie Madoff. Yeah. How do we as financial planners um, learn to be able to handle these questions from clients? Yeah, well, because I've had that education background, like we've been working on a project at Bitcoin Trader at the moment, um, at, which is basically going to be a training course. We think it'll be either one day, it may branch into two. So it'll be similar to a certificate that would be registered with Kaplan or one of the major training groups uh, along the lines of doing a margin lending course or an right. SMSF course or something like this. Because we see that we don't have a problem with advisors giving professional advice from the point of view of saying to a client, look, I don't think this is a pretty good idea for your portfolio, or I do think it is, but what we want is advisors to come from an informed space. Mm. So when I was in accounting and and financial planning, I really didn't want to be found out if someone asked me about something I knew nothing about. So my general reaction conservatively was, hey, that's a bad idea. Yeah. And often the client, because you've got established trust with them, wouldn't even ask any more questions about that. They'd just mm. take what you said as gospel and, and that's the respect of a professional. But uh, or every professional, in my view, needs to undertake some sort of research and not be just closed down immediately on something and say, oh, it's just a tulip bubble or it's this or whatever. Mm. I, I don't have a problem with people getting to that decision if they've based it on some sort of quality research. And 
Number one, people haven't read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. It's only six pages. Um, no one's read four or five of the books off Amazon on how cryptocurrency works. Mm. Um, they're basically either don't have any themselves or if they're clients, that's the other thing. When With a lot of self-managed super funds uh, trustees, they tend to be into that space because they're into control anyway. Yeah. And so when that comes, it's a bottom-up push that we're seeing at the moment. So you've got the trustees sitting here at the fund asking the advisor above, hey, should I invest in this space? And the advisor might respond, no, it's a bad idea. So then the trustee <laughs> goes, well, stuff you, mate, just like water in a stream. Do it anyway. <laughs> they, they go around the rocks and they go and find <laughs> something anyway. Well, you, you end up being not the professional, not not the one throat to choke, not the, the source of knowledge. Yeah, and well, most most trustees are self motivated. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a super fund in their own right anyway. Self managed, self managed space. Um, so majority anyway. So they find some other way. So one of the problems has been in the Australian market is that when you are onboarding as a client in say with Coinbase, Coinspot, Coinjar, these sort of major groups in the early last six months or so, they could only onboard you as an individual. Yeah. So if you've got a corporate trustee in your fund, you've opened a wallet account. Now on a crypto exchange now mm. in your own personal name. Mm-hmm. So whether you've got a corporate trustee or you've got more than one trustee, and if you've got an individual fund, you've got two trustees anyway because you've got to have yep. an extra person. So immediately there, you've opened an account in your own name, taken money out of the fund and started to buy crypto yep. with that account. Well, that's oh, a breach shit. of, yeah. yeah. What was that claim? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to swear, but it's a breach of the SIS Act. It's a little bit like when um, people were like, oh, it's a super fund and i got my own bank account and uh, I'll just transfer it to this account. <laughs> yeah. That's just because right. I need the money. <laughs> yeah. well, and, they're, and they're 30. That's right. <laughs> well, I remember that in the early days. You get their bank account from an audit perspective and you, you see the, the transfer of contributions going in. Then you see Bunnings. Coles New World, <laughs> the good guys, especially close to Christmas. You know, so my uh, like, overdraft account. Like. <laughs> so, and they, you'd say to them, you, you can't do that. And they go, oh, but I'm going to put it back in at the end of the year. <laughs> nah, so, nah. So, so what, what we call that is driving down the crypto highway into the potholes that are virtually unintentional. So yes. some of these breaches have not been intentional, but they do present major problems for both advisors and subsequently the auditors of mm. those funds when they come to not only validate the assets, you know, because they could have put then the money into XYZ ICO or wherever it's gone mm. to. So there's an issue around that. And there's also but there's the major issue of the breach of yeah, this totally. because of ownership. It's basically... Um, in an, is that one of the biggest ones that you I, I saw think so. at the SMSF conference? Yeah, yeah, I think so. so the, what about a breach of the investment strategy? Mm. Well, the, if you go through the process, we've got a six-step process. So the first thing was, I want to buy some crypto. Okay, let's check the trustee. Most trustees don't have uh, an exemption against crypto, so that's usually not a problem. Yep. Yeah. But straight away, you, your investment strategy won't have an asset class that says crypto there Correct. if you haven't yeah. got any, so what especially it- yours. <laughs> oh, I love it. I just uh, open architecture, <laughs> that's alternatives. Right. That's right. Would alternative class- sectors. Is it classed in alternatives? Where yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you it's, generally just go. Yeah. So if you have a catch-all alternatives yeah. clause, that should be... It's fine. Okay. Mm. So we got a, an opinion from a PKF um, specialist partner in this space before we set this up last year. So, and, and we could see that this issue was happening with the onboarding of the trustee. So let's go back. So we looked at the trustee. That's okay. Then the investment strategy has to be updated. Mm. And then when, when the actual person is onboarded, say, through our practice, it actually gets done in the trustee's name. They get a contract note for the purchase of the coins mm. in the trustee's mm-hmm. name, whatever that is, corporate individuals or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they've got a contract note just as if they were buying shares that way. Secondly, the next issue that comes in if they're long-term holders is security of the actual uh, coins themselves. And many people will hold those down inside their mobile phone in what's called a hot wallet, yep. which is... Connected not, to the internet. Yes, so it's not that safe. Hackable. And so hackable, yeah. So there's been exchange <laughs> hacks. There's been uh, – I'll, I'll give you an example of a hack that, that happens in the hot wallet space. The, there's a QR code that you can scan with your phone yep. that brings up your wallet address. What some of the hackers have done is got in behind the QR code. Wow. You scan it and you think that's your address coming up. And oh, because it's no. a 20-digit code – the, it actually goes to the hacker's address because what you're doing is clipping. That's internally. crazy. So well, they're hacking into the QR code scanner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And they've also done that inside Windows clipboard. Oh, so, wow. Oh, when you copy stuff. You, know, you copy and paste your uh, wallet address through the clipboard. Yeah. 
it, not many people are going to check the 20 digit code with XYZ, 2, 3, 4, 5, capital A, B, C, D. But every transaction we do, we do a read back between two people in the office. Wow. Yeah, okay. Because we'd only do $10,000 coin transactions. Not that that's the issue for read back, it's, it's a security thing, but also because it's the consequences of loss of that sort of money in yeah. a decentralized network. You can't you can't ring up customer service yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. and ask for it back somehow. Well, for this the is like wrong so the, the ones in Japan where there's like millions of just going MIA. Like yeah, that was the neo hack. Yeah, yeah. Mm. but well, they actually so found what, that wallet address. And okay. I don't know if you saw the video, but you know, being Japan, you know, there's a lot of loss of face. So a lot of the directors stood there with their hands like this, saying, "We'll pay it back." So it was half a billion dollars that was hacked out of the mm. neo accounts. They, they know the address it went to, so I got frozen. But uh, but so it can't be. To recover. You can't no. You can't release it because whoever's hacked it's got the pin code of mm. the private uh, hash code to the address on the blockchain. So you can know where it is, but it's a problem. So, it's a big problem. Downside is that when it does get hacked, because it is so secure, you can't get it back. Yeah. So the, the idea is that so you've got the hot wallets on one side and a device like this, and the alternative <clears throat> I should have brought one with me today, but it's a USB type device, which mm. is either a, a Legend Nano S or a Trezor device. We use Legend Nano. It's a French company. So when when we set those things up for the client, they come in a sealed box. So we don't use any um, items that have got the broken seal. Because mm. we don't know it's been tampered with or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So that actually sets up the um, pin code for downloading to what we call cold storage. So that plugs into your laptop. Yep. And then through a program, downloads the private key. Because okay. people go, oh, my coins are in this device. No, 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 no. Your pin code, your hashed yeah, yeah. code private address is in that. What happens if you yes. lose the device? Okay. So when you set the device up, this is a digital age, Adrian, right? Yep. Uh, a digital age and then the device actually gives you 24 words that you have to write down, preferably on a piece of paper. So Why a bit not? more than mother's maiden name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. it's 24. In, it's in American spelling. So humor is O-R, color is O-R, not O-U-R. So you, some people make it a spelling error. So you write those 24 words down. And we, we have a special card we use for that and we laminate it. Because what happens with our clients if they're holding long term is we take the Legend Nano device and one <coughs> copy of the card and it goes into a vault in Castle Ray Street, uh, underground security. Right. So once the client has transferred their coins onto this physical device. No, they've transferred their PIN number. Sorry? The they're coins trans- are up on the blockchain. Sorry, and then yep. the 20 words are the backup. 24 to, words, yeah. 24, 24 yeah. So words. If, that, if that device gets lost, coffee spilt on it or something like that, you can go back to the internet online site, put in the 24 words, and that will be hashed through the 256 encryption, and that will unlock the code to you, your account. And then you can re-add it to a new... Yeah, um, you can, you've opened your account. Do you like, use yeah. the, the Nano S and the bit of paper in the same wallet? Uh, well, sorry, what, we sorry do in have the multiple, same We vault? have multiple copies. <clears throat> so we have one copy... Uh, cold storage in the vault, yes. and then we give them two other pieces to put with, um, you know, somewhere secure. Now, right. this brings up the issue of estate planning. Yes. Because what happens is now, um, and this is just not in crypto, but, it, you know, your classical um, written will, which you still know now, has to be on paper, and you've got mm. a testamentary trust built in and all these other things you may have, which is your instruction document to look at the physical assets, which you can then go and find, houses, you know, shares and whatever. However, the digital life that people have these days is something that advisors really need to look at. Mm. That's from bank account passcodes, shutting down all your email accounts, Mm -hmm. getting access to um, anything that's kept on the digital chain, Mm. including crypto. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to go into this a bit more because it's been raised um, a bit on uh, the XY advisor group around because I guess estate planning professionals – Maybe a bit more traditional in terms of if they haven't migrated to this digital world, there's sort of a, there's a big gap that's that's it around is. for people's estates. Yeah, so like when I was in practice, we used a uh, fixed price law service, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a number of those in the country that uh, we that you can you can look up on the internet and use. And so they will charge normally for a couple about sixteen hundred dollars for a will with a testamentary trust power of attorney, letter of wishes, you know, the whole package. Mm. So that's great for the documentation side, and they'll take the legal um, side of that. So, mm-hmm. But what happens is that lawyers tend to, and this is just a general commentary, that they tend to be reactive. So you give them instructions and then they put something together, mm. whereas an advisor is proactive. Mm. So they're in an ideal space to know the client's balance sheet and their structure and then uh, elicit from them their family structure as well. So mm-hmm. we used to build a mind map on that, and often mm-hmm. they'd say, oh, 
I'm not too keen on my adopted son. So we draw a red line between, you know, the, say the father or mother into that person. Because when we presented it to the lawyers, they would then come back and say whether there was a family law issue yep. if we tried to exclude that person from the structure. Mm. So that puts the advisor in a space that they can be the facilitator, if you like, of the estate plan, but not have to carry the legal weight mm. of the preparation of They're the, the documents. They're the identifier can, of the issue. Yeah, like in Sydney, you can charge four thousand dollars for that advice, easy, mm. right? And we were getting charged sixteen hundred bucks from the lawyer, so that's a great profit model for a three hours. Oh, work so you absorb so. the law cost. Well, with, you can get it billed directly to yep. the client, yep. and then just charge the excess facilitation because mm -hmm. the facilitation part is the most important. Mm. And well, that's that, where you're extracting yeah. the information. Yeah. Yeah. And so, because when you're doing estate planning, you've got the logical flow of the money and assets, but you've also got a lot of emotion happening, mm. especially around. You know, you've seen family breakups and things like that, and it brings up a huge amount of emotion. So it, it's quite a moving experience when you sit with a client and they actually start to talk about their um, their, their death, mm. and mm. then how they would then. And sometimes I mention charities or particular children they want to look after for what, for their own personal reasons. It's quite moving. Mm. It's a it's actually a lovely part of the practice, in my view. The the context, I guess, that you're alluding to that the advisor has relative to. This is the challenge of specialised services because Correct. they're coming in, they're trying to deliver a, a great service, but they're they're dependent on what they can extract from an information standpoint and Correct. contextual standpoint in that moment in time. Yeah, and this is, I guess, what you're alluding to that the advisors in the position to already have that breadth, I and then have it. yeah, they pretty much got it. And then so like what we're doing is actually going, okay, well, what do the estate planners need? We'll extract that information through the journey on our side. And then, you, and then yeah. they're the specialists that deal with all the legal side of things. Um, we just lay out the context of everything. Yeah, well, one of the things with estate planning and, and lawyers is you think, oh, there's no limit on the expense. So if you're using a fixed price law service, you know exactly what the cost mm. will be as a quote once you present the information up electronically to their website. Yep. And so I can give you the name of a couple of firms after the show if you want to um, pursue yeah. that further. So so you load that up and so they've got that within 72 hours, they're sending you down the draft documents. Yep. And or they're also sending an email saying there could be family law issues here, there, we need to look at that. One example we had with one case was that they wanted to exclude a particular child under 18 that was from a love relationship when the family um, principal people had broken up for a two year period. This guy had gone off and met this other woman and had a child and the boy was now 15. Now his current wife, which he was the one he had before. This is complicated, right. isn't yes. it? On a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a Thursday morning. <laughs> but as, as the, his current wife came back with him and they still had other babies and that together after that. And so what happened was that she didn't want to know anything about this other child that he mm. had in the break period and didn't want to know anything about the mother either. So we have totally briefed the lawyer on this, right? It's mm. really, and, we, and so we get three pages into the, re, the will reading and the, and the, and the lawyer says, now, now, if if you will call to um, Janice. Now, Janice, if you die and Bruce dies as well, your children will need to be looked after from, by someone. And so, we've appointed this other one, <laughs> this, oh, this other woman as the. As, yeah, this so is all Janice. they saw oh, yeah. is like all they identified is there's this relationship. <laughs> oh, they completely no. missed the context. They, they missed the context completely. Right? <laughs> so we've appointed this other woman who you know the current <laughs> wife is probably calling which number two? The Scarlet yeah, Letter. The Scarlet, yeah, the Scarlet Letter, and so. So, you know, where's a broom? And so and so she's she's you know when you remember people change colour from the chest up with a with yeah. open neck oh, she's got an open neck dress on. You could see the colour rising like this, you know, oh. like this. And I'm there like, oh my god, we're only three pages into a thirty page document. How much bad can this be? So so as we're going through that and we got to the end of the document, I said, Look, I've got to tell you, I had briefed this lawyer and I had no idea she was gonna bring this information up, but now that she has I said, we're going to fix this for you. Oh, how are you going to do that? I'm, you mean you're going to kill her for me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. We're actually going to take out an extra insurance policy on Bruce's <coughs> estate to cover the inheritance money for the love child. And Smart. so what she went, oh, fantastic, because what she saw is the estate was here in that block mm. and now we're adding some insurance on top that she didn't see was really something that she would have inherited anyway. she's missing anyway. out of. She's yeah. not missing out. Yep. It was a great solution, but Very it came good. from a nightmare. Page mm. three. And it's, I guess, like, <laughs> you know, like everyone that's listening to this has had those sort of things with clients. Oh, yeah. my God. I remember years ago this woman came in and she was slightly portly, you know, and we had these chairs that had <laughs> sides on them. Well, she was there for 90 minutes, and when she got up, the chair was stuck to her body. Oh, bless. Oh, my God. You know? Bless. So uh, as an advisor, you cannot do those number of interviews. 
<laughs> without having major events and, and life experiences, what I call spiritual growth experiences as an advisor. <laughs> yeah, they're tumultuous times. <laughs> Absolutely, when, when, you, when you do suffer through them. Um, <laughs> So, so Actually, uh, Clay's got some great ones. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we all do. Our we junior do. days as advisors, they were. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, some, there's some horror stories in there. But um, getting back on track. Um, so, so but we, as far as crypto is concerned, in all of that, um, where it ends up in the estate is that there needs to be a record. Correct. Yes, and so in the in in the will, uh, we need to say here is the location. Correct. Of the, the hard wallet, the cold storage, as well as any, for whatever reason, that isn't found, there is secondary backup 24 code. Word story, yeah, yep. 24 backup, yeah. Found in this location. And I've seen cases already, and we're only new in this, of that happening and the, and the clients didn't know that they had it. We found out indirectly that the guy had died. Wow. And we've contacted the family and said, do you realise there's a wallet in Castle Ray Street in the vault? And they're going, wow. what, what wallet? Yeah, wow. Yeah. Which is, and, and potentially there's a lot of money in there. Yeah, there was fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, in which coin is there. decent mm-hmm. amount, right? Mm-hmm. So um, this, I guess, this represents like even besides Bitcoin, in terms of you're looking at banking just in general and the yeah. way everything's been digitized, all this backup and these innovation techniques around how you have the second factor of authentication, Correct. how you have backup. Like it's really, I find this really interesting because it actually represents the trend, the full transition into the digital age. It is. And all these innovations on how to, like to me, that still seems like a shitload of friction in their client experience. So if someone can nail a secure way to- Exactly back this stuff up without having vaults, without having, because it's, yeah. it's obviously not there because you'd probably use it if it was decent. Yeah. Um, like I well, think you can do a be... lot without the, the cold storage wallet, but th- the point that we're making is it's not always the safest. And so mm. you can do a lot without all this cold wallet, right? Okay. You, you can keep it on, on online. Mm, on, it on online. Yeah. yeah. But, so it can be frictionless. Mm. The result, however, is there's more risk. What so I'm alluding to is that same level of security it's, you, can't, you can't. I don't know. You can't, but you I reckon can't. there could be some innovation. Though. Yeah, I, I think I think that's true. <laughs> a bit of faith, though. Yeah. I mean, what's coming? There's got to be something it, coming down. Yeah, if you if you think that um, see, there's a there's a wallet there now, mm. right? With um with um Coinspot, right? And there's the coins in there. A few little, right? few little ICOs. Right. Is that what they are? There's no ICOs there, right? Ethereum. And there's the total, right? Mm-hmm. But that was twenty one thousand dollars four days ago. So sixteen, what is it? Sixteen zero eight zero at the moment. So it's a four thousand dollar decline in value in four days. Now, Wild bride. Yeah. Now I'm only showing you that to you so I can back up your tulip theory. But but the <laughs> but the what I'm saying is that if you're going to be sitting with even that's only a twenty one thousand dollar sum I you know brought in to show you that's a live wallet. Mm. So that's online. So if they, those guys get hacked or something, that's mm. not on cold storage, right? Totally. But but it's also able to be um, traded across a whole range of coins. That's why that particular platform is attractive. Mm. But the idea um, is with that particular thing is that what I'm showing you is the volatility. And not that many people can go out in the surf, crypto surf, if you want to call it that, and handle a 12-foot wave. Mm. They can't. So that's important for advisors to talk to clients about. Well, actually, is, you know. is the volatility. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. to give you a bit of context on my perspective on it is that the reason I've stayed away is because I'd be on, I'd be, you know how they opened it up to CFDs and futures markets? I'd be onto those markets with it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, see, that's I, like the person that says, I can't go and have one two his beer because I'm going to get in that's, the bourbon that's well. and, yeah, uh, I'll be on the couch, you know. Adrian, uh, yeah. Adrian uh, back in the day, had, you know yourself? Uh, had a yeah. history of trading <laughs> CFDs. Oh, for no. gold and silver. Oh, no. and, yeah. uh, and, and, and he made uh, uh, half a million bucks, you know, as, as an early 20-something, right? Yeah. And then uh, in the same way that he made it, he, he, yeah. he lost yeah. it. And so... Any any sort of talk of anything to do with crypto, he goes, uh, well... I can see where it's coming from now. Yeah, yeah exactly. I put my, so, I, I, yeah. I'd like to um, put myself in a box of... Like, I know. With buffers and let my risk uh, appetite sort of play out in other directions. Managed yeah. funds. <laughs> Let's talk about managed funds for a second because brand new to the market as far as our cryptocurrencies are concerned. Yeah, so we were talking about <clears throat> volatility on an individual basis and you've got a certain amount of the herd and, and the herd is the general public. To, it, it does, it's not a detrimental to, uh, to, uh, term. <laughs> term. <laughs> herd of turds. <laughs> 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 it's, Apologies, apologies for that. <clears throat> apologies but, to no, you, herd like, turds out there. No, Clay, look, it's just, you know, I see the herd like, you know, the walking dead. Yes. There's a, there's a couple of, 
yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, people yeah, there, yeah. you know, and yeah. someone says, look, take your motorbike and go down the highway there around the corner and see if there's anyone coming. Yeah. And you go down there and there's like, there's 10,000 of them all coming up the highway. $19,000 yeah. of yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nine, right. I'm going to buy some that's more. It's going to go up forever. This, this is what it was like before <laughs> Christmas, you know, yeah. the, 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 the crypto herd. Crypto, yeah. Crypto herd was coming down the highway, you know, and we were going, "Oh my god, we've got to get these new systems. We've got to do this and that, or whatever." Yeah, Jan- the shotgun January, out. Right, yeah, but- <laughs> January's a bit quieter. <laughs> yes. So, um, and then double tap if you've seen any crypto movies. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so what happened is that the volatility is really for the early adopters, the two percent that want to go into exchange and buy and sell and do that. That's not the herd. Yes. So, the herd will be taken up <clears throat> in the crypto space through managed funds. Or ETFs, and, yes. <clears throat> ETFs, similar things. So, yep. so that means there'll be a portfolio. It might be top four or five coins in there. And what some of the groups are doing is doing quality research on ICOs to get in on the seed round, which mm-hmm. often means that if they're good quality, when they launch on an exchange, they go up three or four times. Mm-hmm. No guarantee. Yeah. But that's going to add a, extra performance to the fund. But it's crazy. I've never gone on ICO, right? So mm-hmm. I've bought and sold maybe about ten different ones. The uh-huh. riskiest ones that I've ever mm-hmm. gotten involved in, or risky, well, low market cap would have probably been uh, something like Enigma, which I guess would okay. be number 50, yeah. give or take. It's got a good name, though. It's got a great name. Got a great name. Great um, branding. So, so ICOs is when you sort of get out of that top even 1,000, right? Well, I'd say the top, yeah. I mean, yeah, you get there's 1,520 coins as of mm. last week or something, mm. so and so, growing. Yeah, and so an ICO, uh, for those that don't know, is an initial coin <laughs> offering, which to me I think is great PR, but a horrible... Uh, descriptor of what it is. Like Correct. it makes it sound like you're. It's an IPO, and you're going to get yeah. a share of the company, which you're not. It's a big dilution of the understanding of IPO. Absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 it's it's some it's some nerd guy somewhere went. Oh, it's like an IPO, but it's with coins. It's an ICO, right? So no. so, so it's a there, horrible. There's coin. no voting. There's no yes. shares. Yes. There's no right to return a capital. Yes. There's no value. There's there's no. <laughs> Potentially, Potentially, in some cases, yep. there's no value. Yep. So it, it's so far from an IPO under SEC and American absolutely. regulations or, say, Australian ASIC regulations yes. as a registered company, it's yep. not funny. Oh, absolutely. But but however, so the term at the moment is ICO. Actually, that which goes into a broader conversation, which the, I think the terminology around this space is horrible. But um, so uh, with these ICOs, these are these new ones for the people that don't know playing at mm-hmm. home new coins that are coming to market. Yeah. And it is surprising how quickly, in fact, I could, or a high, high, high percentage of times when a coin is listed, it spikes in value. It does. Now, I've never, and the reason for that is, Listed on an exchange. Listed on an exchange. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the reason for that is, my understanding, is that, even f- for the few people that get involved in crypto mm-hmm. and even fewer amount get involved in anything outside of the top five mm-hmm. and even fewer amount are willing to go onto these individual websites and convert their Ethereum or whatever it is yep. into these pre-released ICOs, Correct. right? So the reason that it's so rare for these people to do it, and I've never even done it, mm-hmm. is that a moment that it becomes on an exchange and you don't have to do all these weird sort of things on the back end, yeah. that it immediately spikes. Correct. And so you've got these managed funds that have got these large, and these are very new to market, these large holdings towards your top five, yes. bit, a bit in cash, mm-hmm. and then a small amount in this higher risk area. Mm-hmm. I mean, something like that it is not... Uh, considering a, a well diversified portfolio as some alternative assets in there, yeah. why wouldn't you have one percent in there or two percent? That, 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 that's the argument. It's sort of like a managed fund using hedging um, with, say, futures spy contracts totally. or, uh, to, to hedge against downside risk in the in the physical market holdings. Yep. Or or um, or escalation of the performance on the upside using the spy. You know, you might use five or ten percent of the fund under your mandate. Yeah. So so that that's why it's been taken up that way. And also, if you're a managed fund, you've got fees. So if you don't boost the performance higher than what people could get if they were just buying on an exchange, you're not going to be able to substantiate your management fees to uh, to a sophisticated market. Totally. And the early money coming in is sophisticated money. It's not the definitely. Third, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think it's minimum one hundred thousand. Yeah, hundred thousand yeah. dollar minimum or something. So those people are obviously got a bit more um, intelligence around market performance. And as I said, you've got to if you've got to say a two percent annual fee on the fund, you've got to do something. Exceptional. Well, well, if you've got this 10% allocation to these ICOs, um, the size of these... The performance. Dis- 
Well, yeah, crazy, right? Because you're getting in at this, you know, 75% discount or whatever on these ICOs. You have to get that. Well, in order to be able to... It's only 10% of your money. Yeah, correct. So then you add even a 1% performance. You need to get it 10 times. Exactly. Yeah, which, which, you know, and it... Hey, you're too bright. (laughs) Just being... That's why you haven't gone into any ICOs. uh, (laughs) Don't engage. And and you can see from the other listeners out there, they're all too bright as well, that these things, you know, will... It's like the early days of, I remember back in 92 when Wells with Bain and Company, we launched uh, the Bain Investment Management Service, which was a master trust, and we yeah. had double fees because we didn't have the size of the fund at that stage to minimise that with wholesale contracts. Now mm. you do through wrap accounts and platforms and so on. But that was a transition over 20 years. Mm-hmm. So this is this will happen over time as that market starts to it's grow. It's more cost-effective for yes. the consumer. And- Correct, yeah, and more liquidity of coins and, and so on, yeah. So the investment philosophy that... Like, obviously, investment philosophy is very subjective to the advisor or the investor themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What sort of philosophies do you see out there? So, like, I'm, I don't know, like, you can tell me what your philosophy yeah, is yeah. around it, but, like, would, in terms would, of how do, how do people – because, like, investing any, – any investing where there's an investor manager – and, like, someone's making a call around investments besides an index, and even index, they're all narratives. Correct. Yeah. They're all narratives. So, yeah. like, what... Yeah. Well, what n- number one, there's no index. There's no, there's no uh, S&P. There's no Dow Jones. There's no index in there's coins. No there, there, there's no reference point. There's no... There's a reference point on coin market cap, which is really basically a summary of what all the current cap values are. Mm. Which, but that's not a function of future profitability or, or anything. So, mm. so the, there isn't any established record like that because we've had such a small time to work with. So if you're if we sat here as portfolio managers and said, what are we going to invest in from a, a point of view, you could start from a higher level and go, well, okay, we've got an asset allocation up here. This is a new asset sector. Mm-hmm. What, can, what do we think is a reasonable allocation <laughs> to this particular asset sector, mm. if you want to call it that? Yep. And we, we don't give advice because we're not um, licensed presently. We think that will come in the not-too-distant future as brokers like ours in the crypto space, but that's to come. But we would say to clients, look, if you want, want to put 100% of your super fund money there, we're not terribly happy about that. That's not mm. advice. It's more an educational point of, uh, point of view. Mm-hmm. Right down to at the conference at SMSF, we said, look, you know, maybe 10 or 15% is a better allocation. But on oh. an SMSF fund in the market out there at the moment in Australia, the balances are somewhere between 600 and $1 million plus, even on two member funds that have been running for some time. Mm. So a 10% allocation in relative terms to retiring comfortably mm. by putting 60000 into crypto or something is not exactly a huge exposure, if you want to put it in those mm. terms. Again, if you're in the Joe Frazier column, what I'm saying is just absolute BS. You know, you wouldn't even put any money there because it mm. just could go to zero, and it could. But it also could go to, you know, somewhat higher. But going back to Clay's point, is it worth the performance of 10 or 15% in that sector to add to the overvalue, overall value of the fund mm. and the interest that someone might have? And I think it's still along those lines that trustees are going, oh, well, I just want to have some exposure. Mm. To this particular sector, yes. Well, if like if we take my investment philosophy in terms of I guess how I work with clients is a diverse. I love alternatives. I love having something different that doesn't correlate to the share market. Yes. <laughs> so and it's it's just to balance out the volatility that comes yep. into play. So I love long short funds. Yep. And um, there's a bit of gold in there. And so well, you got- let's talk about this then, because it, it it is surprising considering you do like to plan that alternative assets. Well, and I was, you, I was yeah. leading okay. into it saying that, yeah. like, right. yeah. on that rationale, and it potentially. Steady could- on, Mohammed. Steady on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what were you saying, Joe? <laughs> I said. A, uh, very, very good analogy. I said you got some good skills, Mohammed. And. Uh, <laughs> A duck and a weave and yeah, sting like a butterfly. <laughs> yeah, sting no, like a butterfly. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! All right, let let's get to the point. Let's get to the point. you're talking and, and, too fast. You've got to talk slower. <laughs> and 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 I think we've actually got the same question here because, um, because I jumped in on this crypto not understanding it really that well. I simply did it because I believed in the fact that there were going to be more people dumber than me. <laughs> that that I literally that was my it's investment so philosophy. So egotistical, but true. Yeah, but but true, right? So uh, hen- hence why I made like I, I bought at a really good time and I sold at a really good time. Um, Do you have to keep saying that? We went down for a coffee before the show, and uh, you t- I think you said it five times. And even the girl in the coffee shop was taking notes. He will not have touched Bitcoin for the next 10 years and he'll still be referencing said how, well he, yeah. how well he did I in said 2017. I said I want a short black she said, that guy's got crypto experience. I wonder if I can get his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, so, but the truth is I don't really understand the value. 
And I think to your point, like you don't really understand the value. In fact, you definitely don't understand the value. I don't really okay. understand the value. And this I is think, a great point. Yeah, Let, and I think this is the yeah. best question to ask when it comes okay. to crypto because I do not know how to value yeah. Bitcoin. Well, there's two levels to this answer, right? The first level is um, is what is value in the first place? And value on the planet is consensus. Mm. Value on the planet is consensus. And I hear people go, oh, you shouldn't want to buy crypto because all the people buying crypto want it to go up in price so they can sell it. That sounds like land, housing, mm. shares. Most capital growth asset sectors are based on that assumption, mm. right? Secondly, the value of something on the planet is derived from future earning capacity or its ability to have some sort of intrinsic higher price rise based on the supply and demand graph. Mm. So if you've got supply of something increasing and it's, say, oranges, you're generally going to find more orange plants being produced so to, to meet the supply. So price will tend to top out to some extent in the market. And if there's an oversupply of oranges, it will go down. In the crypto market, if you take specifically Bitcoin, it's got a drip feed supply, 17 million coins so far, and it's going to be another 40, 50 years before the rest get supplied. And you've got a large amount of that 17,000, which is locked up. People have lost their keys. You've got a lot of people holding it long term. You haven't got the herd actually buying any yet. So there isn't even the level of demand we could see when the institutions come with more of their managed funds. Yet you've got this drip feed system of supply. So supply and demand is going to tell you that potentially, this is why some of the analysts like Ronnie Mowis and others out of New York are saying that the price could be astronomical. astronomical. Well, wouldn't See, it, I started to stutter even as I said that. Yeah, and, and as soon as you put that, I my my mind started ticking over very rapidly. Would, but wouldn't just to, to get around that issue, that market manipulation, if you want to call it, create a synthetic ETF? No, yeah, potentially. But if in the physical market of the Bitcoin price, is going to drive any synthetic on top of that. If you look at mm. futures, well, it's always derived. It's a derivative. It's derived from derivative. Yeah, derived derived, from yeah derivative is derived from the, the ex derivative expert here on CFDs knows <laughs> that the 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 derivative is derived from something in the physical world, whether it's an but if index it's, if or if it's synthetic, it's, it's not creating the demand though. Well, it, it, we're, yet, to, we're yet to, to see your point, that. If, yeah. Once the institutional money comes what, in, to give liquidity. Well, no, no, no. So hear me out. So uh, institutions come in, say JP Morgan go, yep, cool, we're going to make an ETF, Bitcoin. They rush in with billions of dollars, right, yeah. I I into the ETF. However... They can't buy the physical. So there's a limited supply for well, their demand. So well, they, they can't buy the physical. Well, are you just saying there's not enough sell orders? There, there won't be enough sellers. Well, that's what I'm saying. So if they created a synthetic... In Bitcoin, there won't be enough if supply. If they created a synthetic... Which is a, which is a futures contract. Yeah, but there's endless supply there. It's still going to... They've already created a synthetic. Yeah, exactly. So that's not going to have an effect on the, on the supply. No, but there's, there's the, the current CMF mm. contract doesn't settle in Bitcoin. It settles in fiat. So, so what they're doing in the UK at the moment is they're looking at launching futures that will actually settle in Bitcoin. Well, if they do that, then it's going to have an astronomical effect of Bitcoin. But if they just settle in fiat, mm. then it's not going to have... That doesn't have an effect, no. Yeah, you broaden the, yeah. Yeah. the liquidity, I guess, of yeah, the space. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you're broadening the liquidity through a derivative rather than the physicality yes. side. Yes. Yeah. But, but because otherwise... Hang on, just uh, calm down, calm point. down, Mahalo, <laughs> calm down. No, but calm otherwise down. a Bitcoin will be a, a million dollars. It's just... Yeah, yes. that, that can be because you've got two markets still operating. Just calm down. He's for been a waiting to have a whole session of Bitcoin. I, 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 I can see like it's got sparks coming out the top <laughs> of his head here. So, so what, what what's happening is that you've still got the derivative market, like you say, but mm. you're still going to have the physical demand for Bitcoin anyway. So the driving yes. of the price that I explained before between supply and demand is still going to come from people that want to hold the physical. Mm. They aren't confident about holding. No, synthetic. absolutely. I reckon the best analogy of what goes on the dynamics is like the gold market to an extent and just because of the nature the there's so many like if you talk to someone about gold and what drives it and mm -hmm. you could get a range of different answers yes correct and the the, the activity that goes on there is the fit, limited nature and limited that's all, nature. that's that's yeah, also one demand. of the biggest appeal of, of uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. there's a limited um, scarcity yeah um, scarcity. Yeah. Well, it's on fear, scarcity. scarcity. <laughs> well, if you look at the word scarcity, it's based on scarcity. <laughs> and it's scar not pronounced scarcity. scarcity. Yeah. That's how we say it in Australia. You, no, hang on, you guys are missing a major bloody point. <laughs> oh, sorry, mate, the, sorry, the, mate. the word scarcity is exactly scarcity, it's fear. So yeah, scarcity yeah. is fear-based um, lack of resources or lack of supply in any future. It runs mm. through the human psyche. Because if we're running abundance, there wouldn't be any price. 
Mm. Right? There isn't any a price on abundance. Okay, so, so so basically, going back to your first point, value is on scarcity. Yeah, so that, that's in the first level. So if you then drop down into the second level, the biggest problem people have is when we went down for the coffee before the show and I said to you, look, you've had a, a piccolo and I've had a short black or double espresso or something. How do you put that back in Bitcoin? Because <clears throat> it would have a different price last week at $11,000 US to what it is today at 9700 mm. when the show's being done. So that's the biggest problem is Stability, everyone yeah. takes the coin and puts it back into something that has in their mind some sort of intrinsic value, which is their local currency. Mm. And that's going to be the case for some period of time. There's going to be an integration of crypto integrated with conventional um, fiat currency, mm. conventional digital banking and mm. so on. It's like four lanes running yep. at the same time. So these arguments that, oh, crypto is going to replace the whole banking system. No, 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 no. It's not going to work like that. It'll be integrated into the system. Mm. Just like the, when the robust. internet came, it became interneted, in, you know, interneted, if you like, is it's a word, but integrated into our everyday life. It didn't replace everything. Yeah. It's an integration. And so, so this is more, this is the way we, our philosophy in the firm works. Mm. We don't go, hey, we're in the Joe Fraser or the Muhammad corner because that just creates resistance, you know. So as soon as you've got force on something, you'll get resistance. That's just yin and yang philosophy. So what we're saying is we're more the, like the water, like the integration of how can crypto facilitate. be integrated, facilitated into the system like that. Mm. Well, like, so you I didn't mean, expect to go down the Zen track this morning. <laughs> I can see you've gone to another level of thinking now, mate. Yeah, He's man. curious. Well, well, I just... He loves just, like, looking for arbitrage opportunities somewhere. <laughs> it's a, well, it's we serious. spoke about... We won't even get into that. <laughs> so, so just with, like, the, the components there, like, I think... Because I think that really... Unpacking it like that really makes a lot more sense to some people when you go, okay, well, it's a little bit currency, it's a little bit technology... A little, a little bit commodity. A little yeah. bit commodity because it's it's Correct. scarce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like all of these have certain values, um, well, and, but it doesn't, one, one thing it's missing is the stability that most currencies deliver. Yeah, the, this is in the currency space, but there's two parts to Bitcoin that we haven't even examined the other part mm. yet, and that's the blockchain. Yeah. So blockchain technology, if you've ever been an accountant or a recorder of books in a ledger, you would write all the transactions down on a page mm -hmm. and effectively turn the page over and then write the transaction down on the next page. As you turn the page, that's a block. Yep. So in conventional ledger, you can get your whiteout liquid and go back 10 pages and mm. change a transaction. So there's no guarantee of, um, of alteration. Whereas in a blockchain, once the pages are turned, if mm. you like, they're locked off encryptively. So therefore, all the records that are recorded in there can never be so it's brilliant, brilliant from a security standpoint. Yeah, and, and then the, if you take that concept and expand it in your mind around where what the application of that is mm. in terms of a platform to build on, just like the internet was a platform that other people came up with other ideas to build on, that's that's where there's a large amount of intrinsic value well, in the he, creation of the blockchain. Well, and, this is, and this is where those ICOs, most of them are going. Actually. It's, it's, they're new types of technology. They're in sitting on, they might use Ethereum black platform to write the ICO app on top of that. Yeah, which yes. which has a yeah. different type of function that's yeah. not seen. Which is its own yeah. blockchain, essentially. Yeah, but the problem, as you were saying, Clay, is that if you get one of these tokens and you and it allows you to play in a gaming site or a property site or a, whatever it happens to be, the end, the question is, well, why couldn't I just use conventional currency to yeah, do that? Why should I, I, I use a the lot token? of this stuff and, is valueless. So but one no. thing that would be great to, to learn about is uh, why the value of blockchain technology – and, and it's going to take me a little while to even form this sentence. Why the value that's in blockchain technology equals value in a coin. So hear me out. Blockchain technology to me is the internet. Now, I, can't, I can create companies that are on the internet that create value. Correct. But just simply the internet by itself doesn't, doesn't. create value. No. So, um, so just because the blockchain exists doesn't give value to Bitcoin in my opinion, just because we've got this distributed ledgers, mm -hmm. you know, on all these horrible, these nerdy terms, that doesn't, in my opinion, give value to Bitcoin. But what it would give value is to a company that was to use that technology for smart contracts. Yeah, yeah. Now, th there is that argument, but I'm going to go back to Bitcoin. An example would be, um, say we go to Africa and we're in a village there and I was saying this before to you, you're repairing a bike and I want to pay you in, in local currency, but I haven't got a bank account. 
I've either got to maybe steal the money or someone else gave it to me in cash and whatever. So our economy is sort of cash fiat currency related to some extent. But we're in this remote village. So we don't have a bank. And even if we had a bank, I don't have an AML KYC process because I haven't got a driver's license and I haven't got a passport and I haven't got any sort of identity as to I have. In fact, I don't even have a birth certificate. I don't even know how old I am. Right. But what I can do is I can download cryptocurrency into my phone and I can pick up the bike from the repair shop that you've done and I can transfer to your wallet account. So all of a sudden, outside of the banking system is a totally decentralized mm. growth in money. And this is not a lot different to the way I was saying that the, the those sort of countries that are coming on stream that, are, that will come to the end of the industrialized revolution and get up the best of there. They'll get the best of the information age. They'll get the best of the of, of, of the technology age. And now they'll get the best of the cryptocurrency all uh, in money one type age all in one go. It's like a leapfrog attempt. So an example would be in, a, in an African village to pump water now, you don't have major electricity um, factories somewhere away that are burning coal or nuclear or whatever, you have solar panels. It's and fun. the solar panels will pump the water up so that people don't have to walk two miles down to the river. So they also do have mobile phones because the towers are cheaper to put up than putting you know wires all around the country, which mm. the Americans and ourselves went through mm. uh, as part of the evolution of information, digital age and so on. Well, Kenya, so, their whole economy almost runs off uh, mobile payments. Co- yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah. So, the, the, so have a look at it from the, the value there intrinsically in the un, what is effectively the unbanked having access to mm. a commercial uh, transaction de- that can grow an economy, action. yeah, which is decentralised and outside of the banking structure. And we're not saying banks are bad. We're saying that those countries would probably never bloom in a commercial sense through the conventional banking capitalist model. So, it's actually so this then model is adding value. If I was to mm. take what you're saying, value then is that the blockchain creates a situation where more you've just called them the unbanked, but essentially a large portion of the population, the global population, mm. can now enter the, the financial world. Correct. Lower barrier yeah. to entry. And, and because of that, then demand is increased. Correct. And because of that, scarcity is increased. Correct. And because of that, the value goes value up. value goes up. Mm. Okay. Although, now, it, it may be that Bitcoin is not the final currency that well, emerges, sure, right? Exactly. There may be... Because they're so substitutable. Yeah, but what happened was Bitcoin set mm. the tone in 2009, but then the, the brains in the world looked at that um, concept and went, wow, there's a whole new direction. It's you know, it's like in the Terminator movie where the guy was using the chip that was in the robot's arm to mm. go down a whole new track of technology. So that's really what yeah. the, the technology change in 2009 did. It actually used mathematics to restore trust through yes. the blockchain concept, right at the time when trust was lost in the world through the GFC. It was Good very point. timely. Mm. That's a really so, articulate way of So is it, it like a combina- going to be a combination of brand faith and superior security technology? And use. Mm. Will and end use. up. Well, use will be there irrespective. Yeah, it will. So you assume that's going to be there because I think that's very sound in terms of what you're saying yeah. of that expansion of the market of people operating in the financial system. Yeah. But the like all this, if you look at all the technology... They're all, there's a lot of them are very similar. So, so really, that, the, that'll be mo- cleaned out. At the moment, Bitcoin's mm. got the brand, it's got the staying power because it's been there longer. Yeah, it's 40% of the capital market. Mm. Yeah. So, which has drastically declined, I will say, over the last almost 10 years. Yeah, yeah, it has, but mm. it has to because you, you can't maintain a premium monopoly position like that in any market. Totally. You know, mm, that's a basic um, economics 101 sort of thing. Good point, so good point. You, you, you want it to dilute to some extent because you want the other technologies to come through that may have more value added. Mm. Yeah. So, so that, that's a competitive market process. So it good turns, point. well, yeah, it turns the currency concept. So you start to get towards like what is used as a currency and you're getting the same benefits there and the yes. stability potentially. Mm. And they're maybe making a fee because they have superior technology. Who's making a fee? The Bitcoin operator. Well, the Bitcoin operator is is the mine. That's another area to discuss, but that's the mining companies. Yep. They're mostly based in either Asia or there's a lot of factories, um, what we call them factories, they're actually just sheds of ASIC mining equipment that are doing the algorithms for Bitcoin calculation, but they're up in Iceland because they burn so much electricity. So yep. they're using yep. geothermal power. They're oh, in an wow. environment where there's only four degrees, so they open the windows and the cool air comes in. And <laughs> if you see one of these videos, I'll show you after the show, the guy goes in there, there's 25,000 machines in a shed. Wow. And there's 10 sheds across the landscape. 
It's just uh, it's the, it's the modern bank because they're all getting Whoa. a clip of every transaction yeah, yeah, that's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, if they solve a block, they, they currently get twelve and a half bitcoins, which you know is one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars or so. So, um, so the, there's what's there's, the profit margins at the moment with that? They're quite high because um, if you've got low power, but there's more power in the world being used by uh, Bitcoin mining at the moment. I think it was calculated than the total of Nigeria. Now Nigeria doesn't lose a lot, huge lot of power. It's so still there a, is a, over a hundred million people. Mm, yeah, but yeah, if you that's if massive. you if, I, it's, just, it's subjective, that. That's yeah, a very yeah. green argument. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but what, you know, you should go and have a look at the power that's used, you know, in, in, in LA. Uh, in, yeah, all the lights that people leave on in their buildings every night, you know, or whatever. You totally. know, there's a whole range of ways that power may not be used in the most efficient way. But, mm. but certainly, this is why there's been arguments for coins to come out, which is pu- pu- uh, uh, less mining. Uh, yeah, there's As they, some they, sort they of other they, limiting they function. Have, that yeah, they have need. proof of stake, whether whether instead of um, proof of um, the other system, proof, Bitcoin, of, work proof of work that yeah. Bitcoin uses, and that's a whole other argument as to whether there's inflation created off the back. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So. just have like. Just one that just drip feeds coin, and that's part of it, and no one has to mine it. Well, a lot of no. coins these days it doesn't work like just that. exist. Because it's got to be dripped from somewhere, and then if it's dripped from somewhere, that gets it back to centralization. Where's it dripping from? There's one central waterfall, one central source. Where's it dripping from? See, we have a simple calculation. Now you're entering Does into the philosophy <laughs> of cryptocurrencies because there's a lot now that just uh, – that. They, they don't drip from anywhere. They just exist. Yeah, like Ripple yeah. is Ripple. R- Ripple is a is a coin that has value because it can be used to transfer money quicker than the SWIFT system in banking. So, well, see, here's the issue that that gives money to Ripple Labs, the company that owns XRP, which is a private company. Yeah, but there's no value there for XRP holders. No, there, there, there is a bit of a problem there. We've got to be careful what we say about that. But but certainly they have five business arms that they're using with the major banks. One of which is their Rapid Service, and in the Rapid Service, as I understand it, is so you're in New York and I'm in, say, Sydney, uh, what you've got to do is transfer your New York dollars, American dollars, into Ripple currency, send it down the line in three and a half seconds to me, and then I can transfer it back into Australian dollars off off the sale through the crypto network, and I've got my money within three and a half seconds. And Whoa. the argument that people use is under the current system of SWIFT, it would take three days, so you might as well if you could put it in a suitcase and fly down and, <laughs> yeah. and put it into my bank account that way because yeah. it's so slow. So, But there's a whole range of argument around um, Where the, the, value the, lies. the value in Ripple, it, yeah. whether it's is substantive, it true. Is it Yeah. Ripple and that's, Labs or is it in the token? Yeah, let, let's not go. That is a... <laughs> sure, anyway, we're really delving there. We can have a coffee shop conversation is, yeah. about Is there that anything one. that's delving into, like if you think about like the biggest issue around um, the financial crisis yes. was around the trust between institutions and the yes. banks yeah. and the lending and um, the over-the-counter exposures and, and arguably, like if you look into how much derivative exposure there is, like it's like 700 trillion in the mm. global, well, it's probably more now. That's, that was like when yeah. I actually looked at that stuff, but it, it's huge. So these this exposure creates this whole sort of um, ecosystem of dependencies Yeah. and the trust and that goes into that was proven quite fragile. In the financial crisis. Now, is there anything that's coming into play around, even like just over the counter sort of um, agreements around derivatives and things like mm-hmm. that that's still going on? Yeah, okay, so let's have a look at that. So w- the, there was the, the pack of cards fell over in 2008, 2009, and a lot of us as an advice space lost confidence, you know, because over an 18 month period, we were seeing a client say, for instance, that had 60% exposure in an account based pension. We were saying, stay in, stay in, stay in, mm. stay in. Then March 2009 came, and it was like, yeah. Maybe more my training has shot to pieces here and I should have told them to sell back to cash six months ago, eight months ago. You know, you started to lose your belief in diversification mm. theory, Bottom basically. Portfolio you know? theory. But yeah. that was just when things started to turn around. But but that was a lesson for the planet around how much trust we placed uh, in that particular system. And it was a, a perturbation, if you like. It was a boiling point. And so what happened out of that was we had to fall back to something. And what we fell back to was financial mathematics. Mm. And so the encryption process in a blockchain is basically trust created by I know you or you can't hack my account over there because it's locked off through mathematics. Mm. And so now I've got some restored trust. So it was like a platform Mm. built. But you can't run the planet on mathematical trust. We're not robots. So Mm. we have to still restore the trust triangle back. But now Mm. it's It's got support. It's coupled with the mathematical basis, if you look Mm. at it this way. That's that's pretty deep. But um, like the thing is, like this this uh, it doesn't get talked about that much in mainstream media, but this this whole sort of derivative exposure and essentially mythical mark, essentially what Clay was referring to before that's been done on the whole financial system, Mm. essentially. Oh yeah. (laughs) 
Um, That's no secret. It's just hanging there as a potential, a but systematic it, it, risk. Well, is there something? Well, the, the, net, the, net, it doesn't exist. Mm, like well, it, it, that, that's, we won't go just there. <laughs> so, I know your name's Mohammed, so I understand. What, I, I understand. what I'm angling for, is there is there <laughs> like a channel where yeah, the, 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 there's more support that could be mitigating that systemic, well, the, the, systematic it, risk? Look, I didn't expect to talk about this, but if you go back and, and look, look at, say, debt markets versus quality stock, stock markets originally, debt markets were based on an interest component, a set period of time, a promise of refund, of capital, all of those components on that side, Drew. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a debt security. Yeah. Yes. If you go to the stock market, there's no promise of return on capital, there's no promise of profit, there's yeah. no actual time limit because the a company as a going concern is infinity on Correct. that side. So those two models existed in the yin and yang space together for mm-hmm. a long period of time. Mm-hmm. The problem was for the GFC was that someone started to take this side <laughs> and take it over to this side mm. to escalate the returns on the oh, share I've market side. That, like, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, a very yeah. good understanding. But that's what happens when you train 4,000 financial planners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that if you see that happening yeah. and then and derivatives started to grow yeah, out the of the, the, the of... weeds and, and there's an infinity sign at the top of that side of the yin and yang, yeah. right above the stock market side. But you keep the same label on yeah, top but of that. So, but this side, it's still got its intrinsic issues of repayment mm. and promise and so on. And so you get to the stage you get where... the worst of both worlds get, in one Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, best of like, both worlds, Adrian. The oh, best. sorry. <laughs> for, a, for a limited period of time until the tulip bubble bursts. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can see that in your mind, you can yeah. see where the problem came from in the GFC. It was a mixing of two things which were should have been kept separate. See, when you bought shares in the 1950s or whatever, you, know, you couldn't borrow. There was no margin lending accounts. There was, mm. you know, it's just no debt that you could do. You had to go on and go take your savings and buy shares or those sort of securities. So do you think even if you had you introduced uh, this support of the mathematical security that can be applied between and they mm. all had accountability between themselves, the fact that the, the debt and the leverage is still there, it's not going to fix that. No, no, but there's, there's a loss of trust in the world now. There's fake news. There's um, non-belief of the kings running certain parts of the world um, in terms of their behaviour and so on. And so that's a challenge for advisors out there because if you sit in front of a client, you, you're being tested, if you like, from minute to minute on your own belief in your trust of your own ability as a professional. Mm. So you can only vibrate trust across to a client if you believe in yourself. And we used to talk about this with young recruits, that if they had to take on an identity, and people say, oh, I just need sales training. It's like, no, 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 we didn't call it sales, we called it influencing with integrity. But the fact is that if you take a Macquarie Street um, surgeon and they've had sort of five years of standing beside someone else that's been cutting into someone's body and doing heart surgery, they take on the identity. Mm. That's how mentoring works. Mm. It's a vibration. Mm. So as an advisor out there, especially XY advisors that are younger, the best thing you can do is work with your colleagues and other mentors to take on the vibration of professionalism because at the end of the day, your work is based on your quality vibration in your own belief of who you are as a professional. And that mm. is not, that's not ego. It's, it's a... It's, it's a, it's a spiritual experience. Sure, sure. It's a, you cannot sit as an advisor after three or four or five years and be the same person you were five years ago. There's yeah. no way. You, anyone that is listening out there, including you guys, know you've changed. Absolutely. You get challenged. It's like you go into that job <clears throat> and you're sitting behind a desk or with clients being put into a position of trust. And that trust is often like an Everest backpack. You know, you're, I used I did it in the 80s. I carried the Everest backpack of clients' responsibility of a $150 million portfolio, which in the 1980s was a lot of money, mm-hmm. all retirement money. a lot money. of money now. Yeah, but, yeah <laughs> but, but that was retirement money. So when the market crash came in 87, it was very, very challenging because mm. I felt personally responsible, mm. that I was responsible for something I had absolutely mm. no personal control over, but I still felt it. Well, yeah, yeah so it's the expectation management that we take on as professionals. We do. We weren't able to, <clears throat> if we can't manage those expectations. Though. No, well, not everyone can do this job, and I think everyone needs to appreciate that that's listening as an advisor, that you are in a privileged position to of gratitude to have tr- clients place their trust in you, but they should also be in gratitude for you looking after them as well. So that's a whole model of advisor that changes the space. The equal sign is different now. The advisors used to be high on one side and clients low. 
and that created a litigation gap potentially mm. between blame and you've done the wrong thing by me, blah, blah, blah. The mm. modern model for you, for your listening audience That's like the blame model. Yeah, the blame model. Mm. And the bigger the gap, the bigger litigation risk. Yep. So if you move that model up into a balanced position where the advisor comes off their pedestal. Which is much more buy-in from the client. Yeah, and yep. you've got shared responsibility, mm. you won't get sued. Mm. You won't say, oh, yeah, well, that couldn't have You're less likelihood of having litigation, but you'll have a much better relationship with your clients on that basis of, mm. and that involves education on the client's position and also involves them taking some level of responsibility for the joint decisions that you make together. We're like definitely that. getting Rick to That's the course, the... eh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be, if you, I'm going to be hassling you to do it. Like, what, what, <laughs> what, what Adrian's alluding to is uh, we've, we've got this new, um, online training portal that's coming oh. out very shortly. Uh-huh. Um, we've got some top minds from uh, financial advice in Australia creating short courses. Excellent. So if that's something you're interested yeah, in, yeah. We, we, we can chat about it later. Yeah, I've got education ethic because I just went into that mode totally. Yeah. No, oh, mate, that was brilliant. That was <laughs> oh, really yeah, cool. That would be great. And, and, this is, and this is like, this is my point. And, and like, <clears> since <throat> I started with this, like you, you, you've eminently qualified in this space and you know your shit when it comes to crypto. Mm. So it's hugely valuable. I think, I think to ignore crypto at this stage is insane. Um, if, if, two, if two things aren't going away, one money, two internet. Yes. If, if those two things aren't going away, then internet money is, is definitely sticking around. And and, yeah. and if we're financial advisors and we deal with money, if we're, we're sticking our heads in the sand in regards to this, we're doing a disservice. Yeah. I, I'm not saying invest your clients. What I'm saying is get your head around this. Yeah, well, we're actually having a symposium in May. Um, there's a, just a short plug, um, which is going to have seven speakers on super tax, um, the Australian Digital Commerce Association, blockchain, like the whole ambit of that space. No one's done anything like that before. We're holding it at the Four Seasons in Sydney. And the reason I chose that venue is because it's got a 12-metre 4K screen in there. It's brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. I saw that and so went, where do we sign? you can see all the, all the hot wallets up yeah, there Yeah, they really can see well. everything. Yeah. They'll show the blockchain <laughs> up on the wall. And How do people get tickets to this? Um, that um, We've just um, finished our landing page, which will launch next week. So um, they they can uh, they can contact us and we'll, they'll go on the list. But the landing page will, with Eventbrite tickets and that will be uh, launched next week. It's on the 10th of May. Well, the, this the, podcast will probably come after that. So what, what's yeah. the URL that people can go to? Um, it's called uh, Decrypted. Decrypted. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just not sure whether I've got two on 2018 or not behind that yet. So um, okay. uh, I think it's decrypted.com we're using at the present time. Okay. And uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to get too into advertising. I didn't come here. Oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're sort of getting to that point want to anyway. Learn more. Where would they? Well, what's the name of the company? Actually, yeah, this uh, is a Bitcoin probably... Trader is our business. Yeah. Uh, and the the problem is, is a Bitcoin Trader has been used by some um, bot scam people in the United uh, States, and that's given us a bit of flack because our, mm. our URL is bitcointrader.org.au, which mm. is an Australian corporation, totally unrelated. Yeah. And there was a show on uh, Shark Tank talking about a a two hundred and fifty dollar turning into seven hundred and fifty dollar bot run by this group in America called Bitcoin Trader. My God, did that make the phone ring at our office? Oh, my mm-hmm. God. So, you know, every TAB betting guy with his um, singlet and, uh, and and stubby shorts on and thongs is, you know, <laughs> ringing with his $250. Well, this just happened to me a few weeks, like this oh, last week. No. It's shocking. <laughs> oh, no. I can just imagine. We, we should put a recorded message on that line saying we're unaffiliated. Yeah. yeah. But one of the guys in our office, you can see his face. Oh, not another one of those yeah, calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and then just to... To, to wrap it up, so um, what what do you guys do? Well, we, we basically deal in the top five coins. We deal in um, in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and Ripple Dash and Ethereum, and we only deal in ten thousand dollar sums per coin. Um, and so we we've got a specialised superannuation service. We've got a, a deal with Express Super um, and some other firms that refer um, clients onto us. We don't market to the general public, so our marketing is to financial advisory firms, to the trusted platform, as I call it, to accountants, financial mm-hmm. planners, those people, because they've already got the experience in that space. So even if an advisor doesn't want to recommend, but their clients are saying to them, mm-hmm. "I want to," yeah, they they sent, they forward us to us, and that right. the last thing is about APL lists. 
you know, you, you, crypto is not on an APL list, but so you've got to be careful about that sort of thing. But mm. you can refer clients on just as you would in the real estate market. You know, you can't really? talk about buy number seven William Street, but you can say, they'll go and talk to this property specialist. and they We've identified this risk. We note it down. Yeah, yeah, you've noted it in the file you notes and so on. You need to talk to a professional. These guys yeah, are professionals. Yeah, so that, like that. Awesome. And so that, that's our specialisation. There are other, other platforms that deal in the general public, but yep. well, that's not our niche. Yeah. Sure. And then uh, you're also on LinkedIn, I know. Is there Twitter or anything else that you're on? Yeah, we've got um, – I mean, we haven't gone down the Facebook Twitter because of the fact that we're more boutique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, Facebook now, crypto ads are banned on Facebook anyway, which I think is a good thing because there was a lot of rubbish on there. Yep. So we've got more of – you know, we're at the SMSF conference. Um, we're on IFA magazine. We've got an in-house journalist that's writing articles all the time. We're the only ones in Australia that people are coming to to get – information like this podcast or yes. or some of the articles that we've written you'll see pop up in SMSF Advisor magazine or, you know, we've got a spread in IFA magazine coming up next month and that sort of thing. So nice. so that's our niche space. Awesome, mate. Yeah. And, and I believe the, you wanted to read out just a disclaimer at the end just to say that it's education well, and not well, uh Oh, you wanted me advice. to read it. Okay, well, I wasn't yeah, expecting yeah, yeah. that. So yeah. Um, well, let well, yeah, me, also let because me just of my um, investment philosophy that I uh, spread out there. It's just general advice. Absolutely. <laughs> you yeah. need to consider your own personal situation with a financial well, advisor. Well, because, because even though this is a financial advisor podcast, uh, there's nothing to stop the general public from listening to it. So, True. yeah, th th that kind of thing we need to... Um, yeah. Um, and if if not, we can... It's pretty much just later. go see a professional. Nothing that's been said yeah. in this podcast. Yeah, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to read it now because I have... Uh, can uh, you do uh, it in uh, your uh, best radio voice as well? Well, I was going to say, yeah, well, said, he has a voice for radio. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I have I wouldn't the, mind getting Rick in just as a cameo, <laughs> like, um, interviewer <laughs> position. <laughs> Weekly. So, so then I can listen to someone that sounds way better than us. No, like, no, no. no this, I, I told you, my, my future career is as a love god. Richard Mercer. Yeah, Richard Mercer. So, look out, Richard, here I come. So, um, yes, uh, yes, Debbie, Bruce really loves you. And, um, and I really feel this. this he doesn't this, have any bitcoins, he's yeah. telling lies. And, and this track from Niall D Neil Diamond is really going to open you up heart wise this evening. And I know things will restore in your relationship. Thank you for the call. Okay, back to this one. <laughs> You haven't had a guest like me on before, have you? Uh, we should and have never more. And never again, yeah. never again. Welcome back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so the disclaimer is that the content and commentary in this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment or financial advice. Any information, material or commentary is intended to provide general information only. Information contained in this podcast has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable. But BT Brokerage Services, trading as Bitcoin Trader and its representatives makes no representative uh, representation as to its accuracy and completeness. And before acting on any information contained in this podcast, each person should consider its appropriateness having regard to its own or their own legal client responsibilities and financial situation and needs. It should obtain independent taxation, financial, legal advice accordingly. And this disclaimer also applies to the Muhammad Ali and uh, Joe Fraser <laughs> sitting next to me <laughs> as well. And uh, and thank you. And, and the night. compliance department <laughs> erupts in right. exuberant <laughs> joy. <laughs> Mate, I've got to say, this has been uh, a super informative, super valuable. I really appreciate your time uh, coming in. I think it's great to touch base with you. It's, I, I'm so glad to see that someone in the industry has taken a leadership in this area. And, uh, you know, I hope our audience really appreciates also um, your insights. So. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers, mate. Thank, thank you. you.